Hello friends, uh, welcome back to my channel. This is your host CBH here. Hope you're doing alright. Um, wanted to do something a little bit different than I've done in the past for this video. Uh, I've, you know, I've talked about some movies here and there uh, through the years, but this one I wanted to do a special uh, highlight for. Uh, so... By the time I'm releasing this, it's around Valentine's Day, so I thought this would be an appropriate time to release this one, and it's one I've been wanting to talk about for a year or two now, whenever this came out, whenever I first saw this film, anyway. But before I do that, I just want to talk to you for a second about my favorite, maybe not my favorite, but one of my favorite genres of movies, and kind of explain why I like it so much, and then I'll get into the main event after that. So the genre that I wanted to highlight in this video that I really have grown to appreciate as an adult is the post-apocalypse genre, which is a wide range of different stories that you can tell with that being your setting and, you know, those story ideas wide spectrum of possibilities whenever you tell one of those stories. And I've seen quite a few of them. Some of them I really like, some of them are kind of okay, you know. Just depending on the movie, but I wanted to highlight one that was really special when I first saw it, and I just rewatched it before doing this, so I knew that my feelings were still the same on it. And Anyway... But the movie that I'm going to talk about uh, for this video is the mo movie that was released in 2020. Not exactly the best time to release a movie, given the whole uh, pandemic stuff going on then, and everything that went to theaters basically bombed, so kind of felt bad for this in hindsight, but movie I want to talk about is called Love and Monsters. And if you haven't heard of it, I'm not surprised. Like I said, it didn't do great financially when it was released. And I think I think people have kind of discovered it, you know, through streaming and stuff like that in the last couple of years. Thankfully, because I think it's something that, yeah, I mean, if you, as long as you have a tolerance for post-apocalypse stories, this is a really good one that... I think if you haven't seen it, you should give it a shot. But let me kind of explain what it's about, just so you have a basic understanding of it. And then I'm going to highlight a few things that uh, that it does similarly to other post-apocalypse stories, and some things it does differently, and like whether or not I think it works better or as good as the other ones in that genre. So first of all, the overall plot is basically an apocalypse happens because of an asteroid and the humans use some missiles, you know, that kind of those kind of weapons to take it out before it took us out. But the unexpected consequence of that is that all the radiation that fell back to Earth from that caused rapid mutations in the wildlife of Earth. I think it specifies cold-blooded animals, if I, remember, if I remember right. But basically your garden variety insects and amphibians and, you know, all the lizards, all these little tiny creatures that don't really, you know, give a second thought of in your average day, suddenly they're growing to be like the size of humans or much bigger in some cases. Did it, Patrick! We saved the city! Just think what might have happened if we didn't tell everyone about the monster! About the what? So that completely changes everything when that happens and like it's not a localized event. It, I think the most it starts in California, but 
I think it spreads to the whole world, if I remember right. Anyway, so a lot of post-apocalypse stuff, you always wonder, like, what the threat is, like, what caused the apocalypse, and what's the existing threat that the characters have to go against. And so this one's kind of different. It's not... It's not zombies, it's not, like, mutants, uh, it's not just other people, you know, like, like, so it's not like The Walking Dead, not like, uh, Mad Max, necessarily, well, until a certain point in the, in the story, but I'll tell you about that in a little bit, um, so it's really different, and I, I liked that, just right off the bat, because... I mean, I like science fiction a lot, and I've always had an interest in, like, speculative evolution and, like, what would happen if all the creatures of the Earth just evolved a certain way that they became a threat uh, to us, whether it was, you know, they just became deadlier, they became bigger, just became, suddenly we weren't the apex predator anymore. I always think stories like that are interesting. And this one is definitely one like that. Okay, so you, you get the basic premise of it. So that's what that's the backstory. And then our main character, Joel, is played by uh, Dylan O'Brien. Very underrated actor. I, every, everything I've seen him in, I've really liked. And... This one just kind of solidified that for me. But uh, his story is really is really interesting. It's like, he is kind of an unlikely, reluctant hero type character. Because basically humanity, to survive because of everything that happened, we all had to go underground. Like, we all had to bunker up and to not get eaten by the creatures that are out there now. And Joel, he's, you know, he's kind of a meek guy. He's not, he's not a guy who would go out and fight all these creatures single-handedly. You know, like, he's not a, he's not a hero. Like, that's, that's kind of how it starts. It's just he's not, he's not like that. He's just a normal guy. And... Before the apocalypse happened, he was an artist, and he always had his sketchbook around, and he was would sketch things, sometimes very badly. He tried to sketch his girlfriend once, it didn't turn out well, but it's okay, I can't draw people either, so don't feel bad, Joel. Uh, anyway, but his, like, immediately I just like this character a lot, because he's you know, he's got the, he's got a good sense of humor, he's, they've all been cooped up a little too long, so they're a little stir-crazy, and another thing is, he's also the only one in his bunker that is single, like everybody else, whenever they got together, their little family basically shacked up together, and, uh, yeah, he was the fifth, or the Ninth wheel. I don't know how many are in the bunker. I can't remember. <laughs> so he's kind of dealing with some loneliness and, you know, just wanting what everybody else has in life. And, but I mean, he's not, he's not bitter about it or anything. He's just, you know, certain people like we just have that longing inside us that we want to find somebody to have a companionship with and. Yeah, it's just a very human feeling, and I like that about his character. But the driving plot line of the movie is whenever the apocalypse happened, he was with his girlfriend at the time, and they had to separate, to split up so they could survive. Like, he went with his family, and she went with hers. And he's wanted to see her because it's been like I think six years since they've seen each other at that point and then he you know he figures out that she's alive and 
she's only, I think, 80 miles away from him. So, like, at least in our terms, you know, that's not that far, but whenever you got a bunch of things outside the world that would kill you the second you stu- stuck your head out the door, it's kind of a big deal with trying to make it 80 miles to see somebody. But that's the ultimate decision he decides to make is he's he wants to see her. Amy's her name. He wants to go find Amy, try to reconnect with her, and since he knows that she's alive, and that's like his purpose in the movie is to, to try to reconnect with her. So it's relatively simple, like when you look at the plot line that way, but There's a lot that happens in the movie that that he goes through and you really see him grow as a character and so I'm going to talk just a little bit about some spoilers so if you want to if you want to duck out now and you want to fifth interests you at all you can check it out and then come back and finish the video if you want but just wanted to say that I highly recommend it, and I know not a whole lot of people have seen it, but at the people that have seen it seem to like it quite a bit, so just give it a chance if you have any any tolerance for the post-apocalypse genre. But anyway, I wanted to draw some comparisons to the, the uh, plot line of this story that you know, other apocalypse stories, like, that it's similar to. One of them I definitely thought of watching it just from the beginning was Zombieland. And like I said, this isn't a zombie movie, but the way that that movie did the whole survival tips with Columbus, and uh, he, like, has the notebook where he writes down all the important things that he learns the apocalypse. Joldkin does that too. He, like I said, he's an artist, so he documents all these different creatures that he's seen, and he writes down all these little tips for surviving, like, the situations he's been in, and all the things he knows about the creatures. So if you like, if you like art, and you like creatures, and you like creature design, this is a really good one for that so it's like it's like zombie land in that way but it's also it's also about a guy that an unlikely hero going out into a dangerous world and connecting with a girl and you know there being a, a romance element to the story too which is like Columbus and Wichita and in zombie land but uh, some other stories that it kind of reminded me of one was I Am Legend with uh, Will Smith back in the 2000s because there is a point where he where he meets up with this dog that who doesn't have an owner anymore because of the the apocalypse and the dog's just been surviving on its own so that's the first companion that he meets that really really helps him through the journey and I mean I'm an animal person I don't know about my audience but but this that part I connected with him and connected with the dog that little relationship that starts to build over the movie is really nice I will say it ends a lot better than the the man and dog relationship in I Am Legend yikes I don't like thinking about that scene. Uh, but something else similar to I Am Legend that this movie does is the idea of radio broadcasts, like like survivors radioing each other from their bunkers and staying up, like their connection, keeping their connections that way. Because that's how he figures out that he finds out that Amy's alive and where she's at. So that's what starts him on the journey. And that's just something else I thought, another connection I made with it. 
Another another very popular post-apocalypse series, The Last of Us. There's a couple of characters in this movie that he meets that are very similar to Joel and Ellie from that series. But, uh, but in this movie, it's Clyde and Minnow. It's an older, older man and a younger girl that he meets and... They survived on the surface for a long time, and they, like, they save them from something, and he almost, he almost dies, and they save him from that, and then they, they, oh, they travel with them for a bit to, like, you know, give them some tips on what to do in certain situations, and just, like, overall life advice, like, it's... Really, really a nice connection that he has with these two characters. And one of my only complaints about the movie is that Clyde and Minnow are not in much of the movie. Like, they're, they're only in a couple of parts, but the parts that are there, they're really good. And uh, it's kind of funny that, like, it, I mean, if you watch the movie, you'll realize Clyde is played by... Uh, Merle from Walking Dead and Yondu from Guardians. That it's it's a good this is a good role for Michael Rooker. He's he's really good in it. And the the girl who plays Menno was also in sixty five with Adam Driver, which is kinda interesting as that's a similar type role for her in both of these films. But yeah, Clyde and Menno, I really like their their characters and they really they really help Joel in his journey in his journey and uh, like they teach him basically the moral lesson of the of the story and I'll get to that at the end because I mean that's how it the film ends so I think that's appropriate where to end it so you know when I saw those two characters and I'm like okay these are these are kind of archetypes, you know, for the post-apocalypse genre, so that wasn't a huge surprise to see characters like that. It was a... It wasn't necessarily a surprise, but it was very welcome, so I appreciated that. Oh boy, the uh, scene that I wasn't quite prepared for when I watched it. When I watched the movie the first time, there's... The scene with a, uh, that reminded me a lot of Wally. So if you've seen that, I mean, yeah, technically that's a, yeah, that's a Pixar, a Pixar post apocalypse movie. I didn't think about that, but Wally really is. But yeah, so Joel and his dog, who he just calls Boy, which I think's, I think's adorable. Uh, so they meet up, they're taking shelter in this rundown. Uh, like a trailer park, I think. I don't know exactly what the place was, but there are these. There's this robot that's there, that's broken down, like its like its legs are missing, and like it was. It looked like it wasn't even alive at all until Joel, until Joel and Boy showed up, and then it's it's like a motion sensor or something. So the so the droid basically wakes up and like starts conversing with Joel because that's what the in the universe of the of the movie there were these sentient droids that were made kind of like if you did a a Google Home or a Siri or something but just like made an actual droid that was just there to help be a human companion and to help you I hope you search things, you know, just normal stuff like that. But I was just like, instantly, that's really cool because I didn't expect to to see a uh, didn't expect to see a, like an android type thing in a movie like this. Now I've always liked robots and droids and stuff like that and science fiction and some of my favorite characters in science fiction are are droids, so. That was cool to see that, but man, this scene just like 
when I think about this movie, this is the scene I always think about. As it's... I mean, Joel has been out bunker for a long time at this point, like weeks, and, you know, he parted away as a Clyde and Minnow. It's been a while since that happened, and he was just really, like, feeling alone at this time. And just a scene of him sitting on a porch talking to this droid that, uh, yeah, it's just really a great scene. Like, as the droid doesn't have much time left because the battery's running out on its, uh, on its system, I think it's like, I think it says something along the lines of, I have 15 minutes of life remaining, and... Like, you know, the droid could have just shut down and, you know, saved those 15 minutes for any, any other time, but no, it's it's a sentient thing, and it chooses to spend its last 15 minutes with Joel. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna spoil everything that happens in this scene, but this was the scene that I cried in. Because, like a lot of the things I enjoy, this movie is kind of an emotional uh, Trojan horse. Where you go in thinking one thing, that's gonna the movie's gonna give you one thing, but ends up giving you something so much more than that. I just know that. I'm never going to listen to the song Stand By Me the same way again. Okay, so I'm going to... I said I'm not spoiling everything. I'm just wanting to highlight a few scenes that I really liked about this movie and everything. So we get to the third act, and it's... And Joel, is certain, Joel and Boy have survived so much together. And they're... And... Spoilers, he, he gets to where he needs to go. Like, he, he does make it to Amy and her bunker and everything. But then things aren't quite what he expected when he gets there. Like, you can tell that, that you know, Amy still cares a lot about Joel and everything. But, given that it was six years since they had seen each other... They both have changed quite a bit as people. I mean, and specifically Joel, because he went on this pilgrimage to see her again, so he's changed a lot just over the course of the film. But I just, it really surprised me. Like I, I was thinking that it would end, you know, just with him barely making it there, like just, you know... Having hardly any any energy left, he's crawling, his hands and knees, and he just barely makes it to safety, and, you know. And then that's when he sees her, and it's the big hero's welcome and the happy ending, you know. But that's why, it's, like I say, and this movie really surprised me with that. Is that it? Is that they reconnect? They reconnect and. She's really happy to see him and everything, but thing, things have changed. Where she, during the time that they had been apart, she had been with somebody that she grew to love, and unfortunately he died about a year previously. But I like the, I like the realism in this moment where it's just, like, if you go through the stuff that they did, they're not going to be the same people they were when they were the teenagers in love back back in the day. But I was, and I was like, okay, this is a really mature writing decision, really an interesting one that I didn't see coming, and I respected that already. So I was like, okay, so it makes me curious, how is it going to end? Like, is it just going to be... Is it just going to be him accepting the reality and just going back to where he came from? Because, you know, a lot of movies do that as a trope. Like, uh, 
like Mad Max Fury Road and, you know, different things like that. It's just going back to the beginning of the story. But no, something else happens. Then uh, they meet these people that come to visit the sanctuary there where Amy and Amy is and they seem on the up and up when you first meet them but Majol just, some, just knows that something's off about him like like yeah he's got this cool captain guy and his two his two uh well I don't know what you'd call them just soldiers basically working for him on this even on this yacht that he comes in on you think it's going to be a big triumphant moment but then i think about what just happened in the story with Joel and Amy and that mature writing and i'm like wait a minute no there there's something else is going to happen here i think and uh yeah sure enough these guys aren't exactly who they say they are and that's when the film kind of turns into Mad Max. Like, not not as crazy or over the top as Mad Max, but just, yeah, I really liked this twist that it, they threw in there. And something that this movie does really well, that it, by the third act, you realize that they basically set up everything. And everything is getting paid off left and right. Like like all these little details that if you're paying attention earlier in the movie, they come back and play an important part in the finale. And yeah, I just really, really like the way this... I like this, you know, action climax that, that happens is really good. And it you know, keeps you guessing at least if you if you don't know exactly what to look for, it'll keep you guessing uh, but then I was like okay, cool so we did we did subversion of what you thought was going to happen did a big action scene, I'm like okay so th this is going to be the end like is this is this going to be where the story ends if they just you know defeat the bad guys and that then everything's okay and that's just how it ends no again it subverts what you think's gonna happen it uh yeah they beat the bad guys and they throw a twist in there about one of the monsters which was kind of cool but then that idea that I had I mentioned earlier kind of comes back into it is that Joel completed his mission, like his journey that he wanted to do, and he realized that he could survive out there. He could survive the scary world, you know, overrun by monsters, and and he makes it a point of saying that if I could do it, anybody could. And he does, he does get some emotional closure with Amy, and I, I really appreciated that. But then he decides to go back to where he started because he realized maybe, I don't know if I want to say undervalued, but like he didn't realize how much his bunkmates and, you know, his family there meant to him. Like he didn't didn't realize how much they meant to him. So now that he survived, he survived this mission that nobody thought he could survive, he decides to go back. And then, yeah, he does, he does make it back to see them. But again, that's not the ending either. This movie just, you know, just keeps throwing you curveballs and, but like every single curveball they've thrown, I've appreciated even though it wasn't quite what I expected is that he's now that he's seen the world it's kind of like the whole Lord of the Rings thing like now you you've seen the world you can't just go back to the way things were before 
so he tells his family all the story of his journey and everything that he learned. And they decide, we're going to leave the bunker. We're going to go to... We're going to go see and find other people and, you know, travel as a group. Make some kind of caravan, go out into the world and find a find more people, bring them into safety, and find a sanctuary that is rumored to exist in the mountains, which is supposedly where, like, the monsters can't go there. I was just like, that, when that ending hit me, I was just like, wow. Again, it was something I didn't expect, and I really respected that. So, I just want to impart the, uh, the final moral of the story that Joel teaches us, like Joel's story teaches us, is, well, well it actually wasn't him, it was Menno that taught it to him on the journey, was never settle. Even in the apocalypse, you don't have to. So, the I know the outside world is scary and everything, and especially when this released, it was a time of so much uncertainty, and we didn't we didn't know what was going to happen next. But that's the thing is we we never know what the next thing is. So. If you don't like if you don't like where you're at in life, don't settle. Make that change that you want to make and go out into the world if that's what you want. So uh Hope I didn't make this too heavy. I hope I didn't over over explain anything, but I hope you enjoyed this little discussion that I wanted to make about this movie that metal means a lot to me. And I hope I've encouraged you, if you hadn't seen it, to check it out sometime soon. But uh, I thank you all for spending time with me today and. Uh, I hope to see you guys again soon, and just remember, never settle.